Bibles, please, in the book of Luke, chapter number two. Book of Luke, chapter number two. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed or numbered. And the numbering, the census, was first made when Cyrenius was governor. Of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth, unto or into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused, engaged a wife, being great with child. And it was so, or it was, that while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. Because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Father, thank you for the reading of the word. Speak to us the true meaning of Christmas today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Christmas, once a year celebration. There are those who say, well, Jesus was not born in December, and they're probably right. Uh, the shepherds were in the field. You will not find shepherds in the field during December in Palestine. You'll find them in the field with their flock, too cold. You'll find them in the field with their flock um, in April, the first part of April. So I hope my wife don't take a notion to celebrate Christmas again in April. Well, I can do it twice a year now. No, just once. But it really doesn't matter what day he was born or what month he was born or what date he was born, or even what year he was born, what really matters is that he was born. But it is sad that we have missed, in many cases, what this season is all about. We have commercialized this date. We have made profit over the birth of Jesus. And it's interesting that the atheists have their department stores and they profit greatly from a religious holiday that they supposedly despise. If you take Christmas away from our economy, there would be a tremendous loss 
of money, especially to the big corporations that make a lot of money from Christmas. Uh, but they hate, they don't want anything to do with Jesus any other day of the year except when it comes to Christmas. And they don't particularly want anything to do with him at that point in time. They want to cash in on the giving of gifts that accompany the celebration of this day, of this birth. But I understand that it's been over-commercialized. I know that. And, of course, the biggest damage that's been done is by parents who lie to their children and tell them there is a Santa Claus. That's a lie. Uh, all you little children, get up close to the screen. Listen to this. Children, there is no Santa Claus. Your mom and daddy won't tell you that. If they tell you there is, there's a lie. Well, that don't hurt anything. Ask some of the most noted psychologists today, especially those who are Christian psychologists, and they will tell you that the first lie that your child remembers that you told them was a lie about Santa Claus. And so what they then do when you start telling them there was a Jesus, they have in the back of the mind, this is another lie like the lie about Santa Claus. Didn't get no amens on that, but it's true. Your child will say, they lied to me one time, told me there was a Santa Claus and found out that was a lie and that wasn't so. Now they're going to tell me there's a Jesus. And so you have developed in the mind of your child a distrust. Santa Claus is a profaning of this particular observance that we are going to celebrate in a few days. You should not be involved in anything that has to do with this obese, unshaven person who lives in the North Pole somewhere. But what does that have to do? They say, oh, well, it's nothing but just, uh, you know, just fun, just a part of. Christmas, it doesn't have to be a part of Christmas. My children have enjoyed Christmas as much as anybody's children. But they've enjoyed Christmas without the introduction of the lie, Santa Claus. And that's something you ought to consider eliminating from your cards, from your Christmas decorations, and from what you talk to your children about. I've had some of them, with my grandchildren especially, and they'd say, people ask them, what's Santa Claus going to bring you, little boy? What's Santa Claus going to bring you? I believe it was Anthony one time told them, said, that's a lie. There ain't no Santa Claus. Oh. But did you know that it can be a much more meaningful celebration if we celebrate Christmas for what Christmas really is? And that's the coming of Jesus and the birth of the Son of God. And Jesus coming, the gift of Jesus, the gift of Jesus to this world. And so that's what we're talking about today. And there are those who have been so crass and have been so arrogant that they've taken Christ totally out of Christmas and they put an X there and they call it Xmas. What a height. Of blasphemy. It's blasphemous when you let Santa Claus take Jesus' place. It's blasphemous when you put an X there instead of Christ. And we hear a lot of people say Jesus is the reason for the season, and I know that sounds trite, but that's so. We as God's people, if we will learn not to be swayed by the world, but you see, the world has taken everything that has to do with an observance of righteousness and godliness and God, and they have perverted it. They've perverted Christmas. They perverted Easter, the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. 
and they have incorporated and brought to themselves pagan things such as Easter eggs and chickens and bunny baskets and things like that. All that's pagan. So the world and the devil has perverted and corrupted even Easter and they've corrupted Christmas and they've corrupted Thanksgiving. And so every, every Christian celebration that we have, if you let the world have its way, they will corrupt it. But I'm thankful there's a group of folk that will not allow the world to have its way, but we will celebrate this day in accordance with what really happened on that day. And I read to you the scripture a moment ago. First of all, I want you to notice that God used a heathen king in order to fulfill prophecy. In Micah 5 and verse number 2, the prophet Micah had prophesied the fact that this one that was going to come was going to be born in Bethlehem. Joseph was not in Bethlehem at the time that Jesus was about to be born. He had no reason to go to Bethlehem, didn't want to go to Bethlehem, didn't have any desire to go to Bethlehem, no plans to go to Bethlehem. So how is it that we're going to get Joseph the earthly father and Mary, to whom he was engaged, how is it that we're going to get how is it that we're going to get him from there to Bethlehem to fulfill prophecy? But God Almighty had a plan, and he moved on the part of a heathen king to say, there's going to have to be a census. I want some tax money. We've got to make sure nobody uh, ducks out on taxes. And so everybody, the decree went forth, everybody has to go back to the place that you were born and enroll. It was an enrollment for taxation, a census that was going to be taken. And so that's why Joseph and Mary was on their way to Bethlehem. It was not that God spoke to them and said, go to Bethlehem, but God spoke to a heathen king. And the heathen king issued a decree. And to fulfill the law and the decree of that day from a heathen king, the Bible says that they went to Bethlehem. Notice what the Bible says. Joseph lived in the city of Nazareth. But he went into Judea. Unto the city of David, verse 4 which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. The first major truth here that I want you to see is that here is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy not only as to where Jesus was to be born, but that he was to come from the lineage of David. Joseph was of David's lineage. God had said in the Old Testament that there would be a seed of David that one day would sit as Messiah on the throne of David in the last days. They were looking for this Messiah. They were looking for this Christ. But he had to have the legal right to sit on the throne. Not only the moral right, but the legal right. The lineage had to be correct. And if you'll study the lineage of Joseph, the earthly father, <coughs> you'll find that he came from David's loins. That's important. This was not just put in there to take up space. We see prophecy fulfilled in that he went to Bethlehem. We see prophecy fulfilled in that he was of the house and lineage of David. And that this Jesus that was born in a manger had to be born of an earthly lineage that was connected to David to give him the right to sit on David's throne one day in the millennium. And that's yet in the future. That's yet to be totally fulfilled. But the Messiah, one day, after the rapture of the church and the tribulation period is over, there will be a kingdom set up here upon this earth, and Jesus will sit literally upon the throne in Jerusalem. Now, let me mention something to you. We've been talking. I've been preaching. I've been pointing to the new millennium for 2,000 years. And those of you who know, bibl know biblical prophecy, you know that there's one thing that's keeping one particular thing that is keeping the stage fully set 
for the kingdom, not for the rapture. Rapture could take place at any time, but the kingdom to be set up. What is it? The Bible tells me that after the rapture of the church, there's going to come a superman whose name is referred to as the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. He's going to set up his kingdom. The Bible calls it a kingdom. It's going to be a false kingdom. There's going to be a man who is an economic genius, a man who's a tremendous orator, a man who can, he's a man of taxation, by the way, <coughs> but he's a man that's going to mimic Jesus, the Messiah. But you know what the main thing he's going to do? How he's going to get the power? He's going to be able to broker a peace deal between Israel and her enemies. There shall be a covenant made, according to Daniel. Seven-year covenant. Israel made a deal with Egypt. That wasn't it. That wasn't a key player. Egypt wasn't giving them that much trouble. Then Israel brokered a deal with Jordan. They're peaceful. That wasn't it. The main enemy of Israel and the peace treaty that has to be put together and it will be put together, solidified, right after the coming of Jesus for the church, it will be a treaty between Israel and her worst enemy that will allow peace to be in Palestine, and that is Syria. This past week, the announcement was made that the foreign minister of Syria was coming to Washington next week, and with him is the foreign minister of Syria and the prime minister of Israel. And they're coming to put together a peace treaty. Woo! I've made cold chisels run up and down my spine just to think about it. This is the last enemy. This is it. This is the agreement that will allow Israel to dwell safely with unwalled villages, as the Bible uses the term in the book of Ezekiel. Syria controls Lebanon. There will be no more enemies. The West Bank is going to be given back. There's going to be an agreement made. This is the agreement that's going to allow the Arabs and the Jews to live peacefully. And this is what the Bible is pointed to. This is what the word of God has prophesied, that the Antichrist is going to be a part of establishing. But here's the problem. It'll be inked, but it'll only last for three and a half years. After the three and a half years is over, the, and it'll be relative peace during that first three and a half years. I thought you were talking about Jesus coming. This is all wrapped up with his being of the seed of David. <coughs> the first three and a half years, it's going to be relative peace. The church is gone, by the way. We're not going to be here for one day of the tribulation period. And the tribulation period actually is a seven-year period of time in which Israel, the Jew, is going to be prepared to receive Jesus as Messiah. But it only lasts for three and a half years. And the Antichrist, is going to exalt himself. The false prophet is going to come on the scene. You see, there's the Antichrist, which is Antichrist. There's the devil that's going to be at work during that time, which is the anti-God, the dragon. And then there's going to be the false prophet. In Revelation 13, the Bible says that out of the sea, out of Israel's nation, there's going to arise a false prophet. And he's going to be a Jew, the Antichrist, a Gentile, the anti-Holy Spirit, the false prophet, a Jew. And that Jew is going to say to the inhabitants of the earth, we're going to make an image. We want you to worship 
this man the Antichrist. They're not going to call him the Antichrist. He's going to have a name. Now, don't get the idea that when he comes on the scene, he's going to say, I am the Antichrist. No. He's going to say, I am who? The Messiah. I am the Christ. I'm the one you've been looking for. I've come to bring peace. And I've brought peace here to the Middle East that has known no peace from the time of Esau and Jacob. I'm going to bring peace. Here we are. And that Antichrist is going to deceive folk. And there's going to be relative, there's going to be relative prosperity. There's going to be a tremendous upheaval as far as the economy is concerned. There's going to be a crisis first. Then there's going to be an economy that's going to boom. And we call this the one world order. A one world system that everybody has been wanting and everybody has been looking for and everybody has been desiring. But there was one problem, the Middle East. There had to be a peace agreement. There had to be that. And the Bible tells us in the book of Daniel, the ninth chapter, that it will be confirmed, that covenant will be confirmed for seven years. And what I'm telling you is that after the Antichrist sets himself up as God, and for you to buy or to sell, you're going to have a mark in your hand or in your forehead. And that will be computer chips implanted. The last three and a half years will be awful hell on earth, judgment years, upon this earth. You read in the book of the Revelation, you read about the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of wrath. I mean, it's worse than anybody could ever say. <coughs> They're actual demons that are going to be unleashed from the bottomless pit. But at the end of that three and a half years, by the way, when the Antichrist sets himself up as God in the temple, Jesus said that's the abomination of desolation. And he tells his people, the Jews, said, you're going to have to run. And they're going to leave Jerusalem and they're going to run out into the wilderness and the earth is going to help them and they're going to be able to survive like that. But for three and a half years, the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, God's people, the Jews, they will be in the wilderness, the earth helping them. But then, Jesus Christ, the one who came to a manger the first time is coming back with the armies of heaven the second time. And he's coming back to set up his kingdom. And those who shall see him who said we'll not have him to rule over us, they're going to cry out, blessed is he. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They, the Jewish nation, will receive at the end of that three and a half years Jesus Christ, the seed of David, David's seed. They're going to receive him and be grafted back in. And Jesus is going to set up David's throne again in Jerusalem. Glory to God, there will be a millennial age. For the Bible says... The bears and the lambs and the lions and the lambs and the sick. All the wildness will be taken out of the animal kingdom. Oh yes, the lion's going to eat straw like an ox. There's nothing will hurt or destroy. And here's the thing, saints. We who have been raptured seven years prior to the time when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom... We're going to come back with Jesus with the armies of heaven, according to Revelation 19. And here we shall rule and reign with Christ here upon this earth with the seed of David, with Jesus Christ, the seed of David, the Messiah. And we'll rule and reign with him. It is important when you read this about his first coming that he's coming as the seed of David. He has a legal right to the throne. Now, most folk today 
And during this time, they'll hear a message on Luke chapter number 2. And they'll talk about Jesus coming as a baby in the manger. And they'll read over this right here, the fact that he was of the lineage of David, as if there's, that's just a byproduct or a by word. But I've tried to explain to you why that's there. And let you know that the stage is set. You are seeing biblical prophecy fulfilled. You're seeing things come about that my mom and my daddy heard me preach about, but they never saw it. I started preaching in 1960, studied the Word of God, went to the university, studied the Word of God, Tennessee Temple University, graduated from there, and I've studied prophecy for years. And you that have heard me preach, you've heard me preach consistently down through the years that there's coming a kingdom here upon this earth and that Jesus is going to come back and reign here. He's coming back for the church first. Seven years later, he's coming back with the church and we're going to rule and reign with Christ here upon this earth for a thousand years. What a wonderful day it's going to be. And what is important about the story of Jesus' first coming is that it was alluded to when the Bible says that Joseph was of the seed and of the lineage of David, which gives Jesus the legal right to sit on David's throne. Glory to God, what do we take a circle on that? When I study the Word and when I see how it's all coming together, everything, you have seen the mechanics of a one world order and a world war system come together as no other generation has in the last three years. It's definitely <coughs> possible right now for somebody to stand up and say, we've got a food shortage. We've had a problem. The computers have failed. We're not able to get the food to the store. We don't want anybody to starve. And so what you need to do is go down to the courthouse and get in a line and get a number. And you take the number. You can't buy or sell without it. This is to keep you from hoarding food. And we know exactly what you've bought in the last month. This is ultimately fair. This is what we're going to do to make sure nobody starves. That the children get fed. We're concerned about the children. We're concerned about you. Don't you know how easy that's going to be to swallow? By the way, we've got a problem making bank transfers. Our computers can't talk to one another like they once did. So we're going to make it very simple. You're not going to get paid with a check anymore. You're not going to be allowed to take a check down and cash it, but your employer is going to take the number in your hand and you scan it and it'll be deposited in your bank account. There'll be no more cash. No more fraud. And with that number in your hand and in your forehead, you'll get your fair share. You'll be able to buy what you need. But you won't be able to hoard fuel or food or anything else. You see how good that sounds? You see how good a world economy, don't you know that it's not right for us to have the food, the majority of the food, when a lot of other people in the world don't have anything? Everything's going to be a level field here. And since we've had problems with the banking system, the only way to do it is for everybody to go on direct deposit and for everybody be able to use just the number. How many of you recently have been asked to give your fingerprint before you could cash a check? Raise your hand. 
I hope you didn't do it. Why would they want that? The next thing, they'll want a number. There was a, I got a speeding ticket the other day. I know that's hard for some of you to understand. Y'all cannot figure that out. And I know good and well I was not going as fast. As he said, I was. But anyway, I didn't put up an argument or anything. But he asked me for my social security number. I wouldn't give it to him. I said, no, sir. You got my name. You got my address. I don't have to give you my social security number. Well, it's right here on this form. I said, I don't care. I don't give you my social security number. Be careful who you give your social security number to. Don't give them to anybody. Anybody for anything. We're in a numbering system. The end of time is here. Even in the scripture that tells about Jesus coming the first time, we see prophetic truth that tells us he's about to come the second time. And the seed of David, the lineage of David, that could go on and on. You see, they'd look for a Messiah. Israel had been without a Messiah, been without a leader. These were the dark ages of Israel. But you see, they thought he was coming in a different manner. Look what the Bible says. Verse 6, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered in the right place, Bethlehem. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, hmm, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. That doesn't look like a king being born to me. That's the way God keeps the secret of his truth and his fulfillment. I mean, here they were in a manger. You know what a manger was? They had two different words for manger. One of them had to do with a sort of a little hostel, which meant that there was a place for animals and there was food there. And um, a host was there almost like a bed and breakfast. But then there was the manger, which was out back, which had nothing but four walls, just four walls. No heat, no food, nothing but four walls. And they kept animals there. That's where Jesus was born. Not in a palace, but in a manger with the animals. You couldn't have been born in any lower circumstance. She didn't have nice, clean blankets in order to wrap her little firstborn son with. When Jesus was born, Joseph had to go over in a corner and get swaddling rags. You know what those rags were? Those were the claws that they used to wipe the sweat from the animals when they brought them in. They had claws there and they had rags that they, when they bring the animals into that enclosure, if they were sweaty, they'd wipe them down with that and then throw the rags on. That's what your Lord was wrapped in. Swaddling clothes. Why did he have to come and be in a place like that? There was no room for him in the end. Now let me say something. I could preach a message right here. There's no room for him today. People say, isn't that awful? Isn't that awful the way Jesus had to be born? And of course, they weren't looking for a king to be born like that. But he came as the lowliest to the lowliest. Nobody could say of Jesus, 
Well, he was above us. No, he came right down to where you were, or actually below you. None in this building was born lower than Jesus was born. None. But they had no room for him. There was no room for him when he was born. There was no room for him in his earthly ministry. The religious crowd rejected him. His own people, he came into his own. His own received him not. They said, we'll not have this man to rule over us. There was no room for him in the hearts of men. Look at Calvary. How many true disciples and believers were there? He was a failure in the eyes of most folk today. And we bring it there to today's realm. There's no room for him today. We have no room for him in our schools. And we sit back and say, that's okay. No room. We don't want Jesus talked about. They're systematically removing all the manger scenes from public property. We have no room for him in our court system. We have no room for him in our political system. Two other things, though, so tragic. We have no room for him in our churches. We've got a program instead of a person. He didn't have any room. He's not Lord in most church services. We've got him programmed out. Here's the saddest part. There's no room for him in our families. Used to be you'd hear people read the Bible. All the youngins have to gather around before they went to bed, whether they wanted to or not, and they heard Mama read the Bible. They'd hear a Christian dad read the Bible. That's unheard of today. There's no such thing anymore as family devotions. Most children have never seen a Bible in their mama's hand at home. They go hunt one up right quick when they come to church. Because they've never heard their mom or their daddy ever read it to them at home. We've got no room for Jesus. You see, when Jesus comes into your life, he will not share authority. You either serve him and him alone or don't serve him at all. He's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. He made it clear. He said, you can't serve me and mammon. You can't serve God and mammon. You'll love the one or hate the other. You've got to make a choice. And this society has made the choice. Anything anti-God, anti-Christ that they can put on television, they put it on. We've ruled God out. We've ruled Jesus out of our lives. No room for them in the end. I close with this. Who were the first people to know anything about being born? Shepherds. They were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Shepherds. Did you know that was the lowest job on the totem pole? I mean, in those days, the only thing lower would be a beggar, and that wasn't a job. They had no education. They had no standing in the community. Usually the community was glad to see them get the job and get out in the field and not bother them. Shepherds live with the lowliest profession of all the poorest people in the region shepherds but those were the ones that God sent the message to because you see they had no future he didn't send the message down to the seminary where the Pharisees and the scribes were debating Old Testament scripture he didn't send the message down even to the temple, to those that were there. 
But who did Jesus or who did God send the message to that Jesus was to be born? Not to the up and out, but brother to the down and out. Shepherds. You ought to be grateful for that. That the first people to know were the poor. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And the shepherds were afraid. And the angel said unto them, Don't be afraid. Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings. Notice, good news. The birth of Jesus was what? Good news. And then something else, great joy. It was a joyful announcement. And notice something else in this verse. And this is a great verse, verse number 10. You find good news, great joy. And you find whosoever will listen, this news this good news and this great joy is to all people. Hallelujah. Everybody. <coughs> Thank God it's for everybody. Black, white, poor, rich, uneducated, educated. Southerner, and he's got a few Yankees. Aren't you glad? Glory to God that the news is to all people. Even Yankees can get saved. Whew. Hallelujah. Somebody on the front row shouting it out. All people. All people. That's important. Verse number 10 is a tremendous. 10 and 11 is the two greatest verses that have to do with Christmas. And you ought to have this somewhere or another in your house written or put down. Go home and write it with lipstick on the mirror. On the sliding glass door. Can't wait to get home. And I'm going to decorate a little myself here with these two verses. And the angel said unto them, Don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings, great news, great joy. Hey, this will make you happy. This will thrill you. This will bless you. Which shall be to all people. Here it is. What is it? For unto you is born this day, the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. <coughs> Wasn't that great news? Born in the right place. A Savior. Man needed a Savior. Who was it? Christ the Lord. I wonder today, have you received him as they come to the instruments? He came... He came to all, to as many as received him, to them give you power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you believed on his name? Is he Lord of your life? Have you received him? You say, preacher, I have not. God gave the gift of his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You walked in here this morning, sinner friend. And if I told you, here's a gift for you. I've got $10,000 here for you. It's yours. But what I got to do, just receive it. Just by just receive it. You say, I don't believe you got 10,000. Well, that lets you out right to begin with. You don't have enough faith. It can be a gift with your name on it. But a gift is not a gift until it's received. If you reject this gift, it'll never be yours. If you reject Jesus, never yours. If you haven't received Jesus as Savior, would you come today and receive him? Receive the gift of the first Christmas. You that are watching my television, why don't you right now say, I, 
I receive Jesus as my Savior, as my Lord. I want to be his disciple. I want to follow him. God, forgive my sins. Save my soul. I receive Jesus. If you'll pray that prayer with me, you can be saved today. Right where you are, right now, if you just bow your head and say, Oh, God, I'm a sinner. Please save me and forgive my sins. I receive Jesus. Your gift. I receive Jesus as my Savior. Right now. Amen. If you'll pray that prayer, you'll be saved. You will have received the greatest gift that could ever be given you. The gift that God gave the world, gave you individually, you can receive. If you're in this building, as we stand together, as Angela sings, Brother Colin will be here, others will come to pray with you. If you want to receive this gift of Jesus as Savior, would you come? The next time He comes, He won't have Amen. to die for me. That's right. Next time yes. he comes, That's right. there won't be a Calvary the next time yes. he comes, we'll begin eternity. One more verse. The next, next time he comes, he won't have to die for me. Listen. Next time he comes, there won't be a glory. And the next time. It was a surprising thing this past week. Took everybody by surprise. But all at once, there was this agreement by Syria to come to Washington to work out a peace agreement they said they'd never make with Israel. Surprised everybody. What was behind this? A lot of things might be behind it. If they miss this chance, come January to set up a new world order, they'll miss a real opportunity. But let's take it a little further than that. I really believe, just like God used this heathen king to get everything ready for Jesus to come the first time, God can use heathen rulers to get everything ready. Jesus to come the second time. Mr. Fay, you come. Mr. Fay's been very sick. She went to the doctor been several times and they're having a difficult time finding what the problem is. But Fay, you know God can heal you. He's healed you many times. Stretch forth your hand. Father, I anoint face filled with oil in the name of Jesus. I pray, oh God, that you will heal her body. Do what doctors cannot do, what they cannot prescribe. Just come in faith, Lord. 
She's lifting her head to you in faith, and I pray for a complete that simple, it's that simple. If you would come in faith, please pray for me. You know, there was all and prayed the prayer of faith on her behalf. And I believe God Almighty is still in the healing business. God bless you as you back to church. Matthew 18, 19. Matthew 18, 19.